USC has a brand new quarterback. And we have a brand new show. Sports Scene starts in three, two, one. I told Max, I said, man, when my greatest dream was to be three and zero right now, and and leading that, and him leading this team as an older kid. That's what you want. That's what your dream is. But then you have to face reality, and you have to make hard decisions. Welcome to the Annenberg Media Center. I'm Alexa Palermo, and I'm Paul Yeti. USC is preparing for some Friday night lights this week as they head to Utah to start Pac-12 South play. The Trojans are one and two for the first time since 2001 after a disappointing 27-10 loss to Stanford over the weekend. The lack of offensive production in the first three games was enough to convince head coach Clay Helton that a change at quarterback was needed. Redshirt freshman Sam Darnold will be making his first career start against the number 24-ranked Utah Utes. Darnold impressed Helton enough in the spring to push the competition into the fall. Helton decided before the season that Brown had won the spot. But because of his dual threat abilities, Helton used Darnold in red zone situations throughout the first three games. Darnold made the most of his chances, throwing for two touchdowns and showing Helton enough to make, to make the in-season in in flip. Now we'll, he will be asked to do much more as he, has to, as he has the whole field to work with. It was a coach's decision, and in the end, um, you know, I'm ready whenever coach puts me in, just like any other game. Um, so I'm ready this week, and we're going to prepare um, just as as we have been. Meanwhile, for Max Brown, the decision places him once more in the position he has been the last three years, the backup. Brown is eligible to transfer, though, but can't play until next season. Brown said he is already thinking about his future and all of his possible options, as his chance to play at USC is all but over. I, I know how these things work. I mean, usually once the once, once the young guy goes, I mean, you know, you know how you know how it is. Um, but I'll be I'll be ready. Uh, I, I owe it to my teammates and the guys I've been with here for. Uh, what, four years now. I owe it to them to, to stay ready, and I'll be ready. Helton's quarterback decision didn't only spark changes to the depth chart, but also sparked much debate on social media. For that, let's send it over to Lauren Dunn. Social media was a buzz with USC fans giving their take on Helton's quarterback switch. Let's take a look. SP Michael 18 says nothing against Darnold, but Brown's struggles are a greater reflection of the offensive game plan. On the other hand, T Schneid 89 says, People saying Max is the sacrificial lamb? Games I watch show Max not trusting receivers and only taking sure things. That halts offense. Many of the fan reactions seem to be singing the same tune, criticizing the overall football program. Chris Camello says, this has been an ongoing issue as Brown has failed to impress thus far, but the Trojans' struggles aren't all his fault. Some are taking more direct digs toward the coaching staff such as Rich Homie Wing, who said if Max Brown committed to Alabama back in 2013, he would be the first round pick in the NFL. So that's it for social media this week. Fans will be anxiously awaiting Friday's game to see if this QB switch was the right move. Back to you, Paolo. Three weeks into the season, we already have our first big change. Head coach Clay Helen turns back on his original decision to start Max Brown and goes with the redshirt freshman Sam Darnold. I'm now joined by Keely Year and Ben Albert to discuss the decision. Guys, what do we think about the decision? Do you think it was the right one? Maybe was it the timing that was off? The timing surprised me. I think something had to change, whether it was the play calling with T. Martin. It's his first year. I thought that's what was going to change. Maybe open up the playbook a little bit more. But it didn't. You saw Max Brown. He's. It's not fair, though. I don't know if it's fair if Max Brown did change because he did play Alabama and he did play Stanford, and those are two very tough teams. The timing is way off, and it's the wrong decision. Um, Max Brown is – only one small piece of a much bigger puzzle that has a lot of problems right now. As Keeley mentioned, offensively, offensive line, false starts, what's going on? This is an experienced line. What is going on there? Juju Smith-Schuster, believe it or not, he actually still plays on this team. He hasn't gone to the draft yet. hope my Vikings get him. But he still is on this team. I think he's got, what, two, three catches, it feels like, in important moments against two of the top teams in the country. They don't even play a Dory on offense. Ronald Jones isn't getting the ball. And defensively, also, you want to know why we're getting blown out of a couple big games. Huge plays are giving up, missed assignments. Max Brown is unfortunately getting the short end of a very, very troubled stick right now. Yeah, I mean, I think we all agree with that, that it's not just Max Brown who was the problem. It was the whole offensive scheme that was 
really setting everybody back. Now, but do we think that Sam, now that he's getting put in there, Coach Helms said he's going to be the spark that gets this offense going. Do we think that's going to be the case, or do you guys don't see that happening? I mean, he could be the spark. A spark he's a dual threat he can run I mean he's no Lamar Jackson he can't just run it give the defense trouble but he can run the ball and Max Brown can't really do that but it like you said Adoree Jackson Clay Helton also wants a spark on the offense but if the problems of the O-line and, and play calling don't get changed how much is Sam going to really make a difference right in this chaotic environment that our team is currently in with all of these problems we just listed off Perhaps Sam Darnold is a guy that can bring a little more to the table because he has the ability to escape out of the pocket when he's in trouble. But if you're talking about a USC returning to a, being a top program in the country, being championship level, all of these other problems are going to have to get remedied. And simply switching Sam for Max, that is not a solution. That's a Band-Aid on a, a big open wound. Well, I do think that um, what, because now with Sam in there, T. Martin, who's the offensive coordinator, can now open up the playbook a little more, have more options. I think they're looking forward to doing that. I think they're going to try more things and hope, hope that those things do help the team. Um, one last thing. Do we think that Helton just made the decision in the moment, or do we think that from the beginning he wanted Sam Darnold to be the starter and was looking for something but had to go with the safe decision of Max Brown? I think Sam really gave Max a run for his money. You know, he pushed the battle from spring to fall. But I think Helton really wanted Max. He really wanted – his guy, but because Sam kept pushing and pushing Max, he had to switch to, to Sam after there's losses. I think Sam has always had that dual threat, and he's had talent, and they've known that, but I think with the whole influx of new coaches and Helton taking over for his first year, Max is probably the guy he wanted from the beginning simply because he's been here in this program for quite a few years and has that experience under his belt. Well, either way, it's definitely a huge gamble for Coach Helton to switch quarterbacks in the middle of the season, and Friday night's game in Salt Lake City is going to provide – Quite the proving ground from Darnold as he starts his first career game. Now let's send it over to Alexa who has more on the Utah Utes. Amid the quarterback change, USC still has a game to play. And on a short week for that matter. There's a 70% chance of rain and a 100% chance of Utah's pass rush making an appearance. The Utes are number two nationally ranked in sacks this season. The unit, dubbed Sack Lake City, has a ridiculous 10 sacks against San Jose State. It's clear that just like with Stanford, USC will have a lot on their plate with another physical team that features a couple of skill players. One of those standouts is wide receiver Tim Patrick, who missed 2015 due to an injury, but has come on strong in 2016. Patrick's six foot five frame and athleticism has helped him to score literally all of U Utah's receiving touchdowns. It's safe to say USC secondary will have their hands full. The quarterback who's been targeting Patrick is junior transfer Troy Williams. Williams is replacing Travis Wilson and has thrown for more than 200 yards in two of his three games. Williams, however, has thrown as many touchdowns as he has interceptions. Overall, Utah's loss lost some talent from last year, but they bring the same physicality that has the potential to hand USC its third loss of the season. The tough matchup in Salt Lake City this Friday might have you wondering, how's the team preparing for a short work week? I went down to the McKay Center to find out. Two horns sound off the start of another game week, but this week's a little different. Instead of the normal seven days to prepare, the Trojans only have six until they face another Pac-12 foe in Utah. It may not seem like much, but USC's senior leaders feel the impact. I mean, one day is, is huge for us, especially in our process. Each day is extremely important and from a, a physical standpoint we had to recover our bodies a lot faster because we were right back on, on the practice field Mondays which are usually an off day for us. Obviously if you don't have that day off it's kind of you're kind of worn out from the Stanford game things like that you know you got to get back at it but I think we did a really good job in doing that because coaches adjusted the schedule they didn't li they lightened the load in terms of how hard we're hitting each other. We didn't lighten reps. We haven't slowed down at all. We've gone full speed, but we're not taking each other to the ground. We're not doing full padded practices. We're being smart about it, and Coach Helton's definitely smart about it. One less day to prepare means one less day to recover. Most of what the Trojans are doing in the weight room and here on the field is the same. Everything just gets shifted around a day. What's different is how the team plans to refuel and get their bodies right for another physical game. The team turned to some new technology to help players start recovering almost as soon as the final whistle blew. Uh, my staff and I were applying these electrodes uh, to the lower leg of uh, the players that played the most. 
and it's a new technology called Firefly. And what it is is it, it stimulates the perineal nerve to uh, elicit a little contraction, a little flicker in the lower leg of a muscle, and it increases blood flow. Especially during a short week, team nutritionist Andrea Vanderwoud has been trying to incorporate more foods that boost recovery. Football is one of those sports that's a lot of intentional trauma, so you get a lot of inflammation. So for them, I promote antioxidant-rich foods, especially for recovery. It's going to allow them to kind of recover from all the inflammation that they probably have from the game, get them on the right track to play again. While I'm sure the players are hungry for nutritious foods, I'm sure they're even hungrier for a win. They'll be hoping that that's on the menu this Friday. For Sports Scene, I'm Alex Duplessis. Despite the amount of talent at the skill positions for the USC offense, it hasn't really lived up to its billing so far. One of those players who thrived last season but had a setback this year is wide receiver Juju Smith-Schuster. Here to help me break down his setback is Aaron Glazer. Thanks for joining me, Aaron. Thanks for having me, Powell. So tell me about Juju. What has been going on this season that you know he hasn't really had that much production as you would expect from a wide receiver like him? So Juju does have only 33 yards uh, you know, per game averaging throughout this year, and there were six games last year where he had over the 99 yards that he's averaging right now. I think that what this comes down to is simply a defensive mindset. Opposing teams know that Juju is one of the best receivers, not only on USC, but also in the country. And so they're starting to double team him and really show some different defenses on him, which have caused him to struggle like this. Yeah, obviously that's a big reason. US, he's talked about it before. He's been being double covered all over the field. But another reason why he's not been getting as many targets is because other guys have definitely been getting more targets as the season has gone along. Who is catching more balls this season? So I would say these three guys, Deontay Burnett, Stephen Mitchell Jr., and Darius Rodgers, have been big playmakers for USC. Now former starting quarterback Max Brown really tried to balance out the offense. And so we saw pretty even numbers of receptions and yards, especially uh, with Mitchell and Burnett throughout the start of the year. So for Smith-Schuster, not out of the norm, it's just that I think we expect his numbers to be abnormally strong compared to the other three. Now, obviously, you mentioned how Max Brown is now the former quarterback. Obviously, with the news of Sam Darnold being the starting quarterback, we look at how Juju Smith-Schuster has fared with both quarterbacks. You know, he's had 17.2% of Brown's passing attempts and 22.7% of Darnold's pass attempts. So do you think that now with Darnold under center, Juju can have a, more of a role and maybe he will rely on Juju more, Darnold will? I think that Darnold, as a more inexperienced quarterback, it's easier for him to rely on a veteran hand like Juju as someone who's known to be a strong receiver as an easy target. But I do think that alongside with that, Darnold can look to Juju as someone who is reliable, and I would expect for him to get a few more touches this week than we've seen in weeks past. Maybe look for the other guys to be a little bit more shaky and see how they play under Darnold's arm. But I feel like Darnold and Juju, as evident by these numbers, have already established a pretty clear connection. Well, as USC heads to Utah, the question will not only be can their offensive talent win out, but also can USC balance that talent on their way to their first Pac-12 South victory. The USC women's soccer team is off to a flying start this season. The women of Troy improved to 6-2 and two after defeating Kansas last Friday. The 2-0 win over the Jayhawks marked the conclusion of non-conference games as the team now prepares for Pac-12 play. A major reason why USC has climbed to number 12 in the national rankings, it's defense. Mandy Freeman has been solid as the stand-in center back for the injured Dom Randall, while freshman outside back Julia Bingham has been a Dory-like in her ability to shut down opposing wingers. Kayla Mills has been shielding the back four as the center defensive mid, putting in strong tackles and showing her outstanding vision and range of passing. The defense rose to the occasion against elite opponents in Georgia, Auburn, and North Carolina, as goalkeeper Sammy Joe Prudhomme posted shutouts in all three of those games. At the offensive end, Maryland transfer Alex Anthony has burst onto the scene, logging five goals and two assists thus far. Katie Johnson is healthy this season and is causing opposing back lines all kinds of problems with her incisive movement off the ball and lethal finishing inside the 18. With the forwards consistently producing, there is far less pressure on midfielders Morgan Andrews and Nicole Mullen to score this season. But don't tell them that. The tandem has combined for six goals through just eight games. The first conference test for Kadani McAlpine's team will come from Arizona. The women of Troy are set to take on the Wildcats this Friday at McAllister Field at 3 p.m. I'm here with Sammy Jo Prudhomme, starting goalie of the USC women's soccer team. Thanks for joining me, Sammy. No problem. So you guys are off to such an amazing start. You have a 6-2 and two record and are on a six-game shutout streak. How does it feel that you're on the verge of breaking the school record for the shutout streak? Um, to be honest, we didn't even know there was a shutout streak until somebody mentioned it the last game. So 
Um, it's not really um, a huge deal for us. It would be awesome uh, to be in USC history like that. But um, for us, it's just taking one game at a time and just trying to get a shutout per game, per half, not really thinking about, you know, getting to shut out the next three games, but getting to shut out next game. Yeah, no, yeah. that's great. And you, ha you yourself have 34 saves and have been named Pac-12 Keeper of the Week twice in a row. Yeah. How, um, what are your, some of your keys to success? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, to be honest, a lot of it has to do with my defense and making it easier for me to um, do my job because they're doing their job. But um, other than that, it'd just be uh, training, going and training with my goalkeeper trainer, Ian Flair, and he's awesome. He does a lot of drills with us that are game-like situations and very um, mentally engaging. So it causes me to be really focused in every single training we're in, which just helps me focus even more when I'm in a game. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand that. Yeah. And you played two seasons at um, Oregon State before yeah. transferring to USC. What was that transition like for you coming here? Um, well, I loved Oregon State. It was really difficult to leave. Uh, I just had a lot to do with soccer and um, going to a different program. And uh, the transition was a little bit tough just because um, I transferred in conference and they penalized you for doing that in the Pac-12. So when I transferred, I was forced to sit a year um, but take a red shirt. But it was actually, other than that, um, it was fairly easy. Uh, the girls made it great. I love my team. My team is very supportive and very... Um, was there with me through like a really tough time that I had in the year that I was off, but now I'm playing again and it's awesome. So. And you're amazing. <laughs> what did you learn in that year that you had to sit out? Um, it was just a, it was just good to be a part of the team when I wasn't able to play and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to play. Um, a lot of it just had to do with, uh, you know, being a good teammate and like learning how to adapt to that type of style, particularly if you've always been the type of player who's played every single game or something like that um and you just have to assume a different role and make the best of that role um other than that it just was it just had to do with you know supporting the team making sure that I stayed mentally involved the whole time that I was there just because I couldn't play doesn't mean that I can't push myself in practice or push the team in practice or something like that and um just making sure that I was there the whole time and like let them know that I was there and that I wasn't just not engaged because I wasn't playing yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, you start Pac-12 play this week. You play Arizona. Um, what are some things you're looking to improve on from your non-conference play? Um, I think that a lot of the improvement has happened within the last few games, which is good. Uh, last game against Kansas, we, we won, but we played a little bit um, not up to our standard. And I think that the biggest thing for us is just making sure that every single game we come out with the right amount of intensity um, so that we can take it to every team that we play. And... I think that that's going to be the biggest thing for us is just making sure that we stay together when we're playing and we're working with each other and we're playing for each other and coming out with the right amount of intensity to allow us the best opportunity to win. So you mentioned to me before that you coach um, little girls yeah. in soccer. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, my uh, goalkeeper coach since I was 11 years old, um, Wendy Whitman, she coaches at Legends with U a U9, a U11, and U13 uh, group. And they're all just so adorable. And she asked me if I wanted to do any assistant coaching for a little extra money. And I told her, yeah. And so I started assistant coaching with her. And then um, since then, I've gotten a few goalkeepers for private trainings and stuff. And um, I just, I really enjoy it. It's a really fun thing to do and to go up and really be involved in the younger kids' development, um, especially in the crucial periods of like you nine to 13 um, is when you learn a lot of your skill and all that. So it's really fun. I really enjoy it, and um, I'm still doing it now, and I will keep doing it probably. You must help out. Fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, no, and so you are obviously all soccer all the time. Is what is, do you like to do in your off time, and maybe what is one thing we don't know about you? Um, I like to hang out with all my friends, go to um, country concerts particularly. Me and a couple of teammates are going. Uh, we went last week to Lee Bryce and – John party and we're going to um, Billy Currington this weekend and just like go to, I love going to the beach love being at the beach um, and just being outdoors hiking um, going out seeing new things uh, meeting new people uh, that's pretty much I mean I like to do a lot of things besides soccer but pretty much just getting out of the house and meeting new people and being with my friends and uh, family and then uh, one thing let me think uh, I was in a movie before what yeah. movie well it's called soccer mom and it's like a low-grade movie but uh it had emily osmond from hannah montana 
and um, the mom, the stepmom from uh, Parent Trap okay. was also in it. And uh, it was just a little movie that me and a couple of my teammates ended up getting picked for um, to go do. And we were gone for like two weeks doing extra stuff. And it was like we were with a team and I was the goalkeeper and then my teammates were the other players on the team and it was a really interesting experience. <laughs> that sounds so fun. Well, yeah, thank it was. you so much for being here. You can catch Sammy Joe defending USC's goal on Friday at McAllister Field at 3 p.m. when the Trojans take on Arizona. Fall sports are red hot and you won't want to miss the games coming up. It's time to light the torch. The women's soccer team finished non-conference play with a 2-0 win over Kansas. The women of Troy are on a streak of six shutouts, which ties the school record previously set in 2006. The team has not allowed a single goal in 564 minutes. The last goal USC allowed was in the 66th minute of the game against Long Beach on August 26. The women of Troy are hoping to keep the streak alive for their first Pac-12 matchup against Arizona this Friday at home. The reigning co-Pac-12 champion USC women's volleyball team starts conference play this week. USC is riding an eight-match win streak heading into the Crosstown Showdown with UCLA and will face off against fellow conference champion Washington on Friday. USC will look to overcome its woes from last season as UCLA and Washington handed the women of Troy two of their three losses. Over in the pool, the number two ranked men's water polo team is looking to use its strong defense to dominate in the Mountain Pacific Invitational this weekend. Defense is one of the key elements that the team prides itself on, but the Trojans are still pushing themselves to improve. We're just going to take it one game at a time. Um, I think if we can grow together each game and improve collectively, little by little, then you know we're going to put ourselves in a good position to, to beat anyone in that tournament. But I mean, we'll go back to the drawing board and assess a couple of things that we need to fix from today's game, and hopefully the result swings our way. USC will take on Santa Clara to kick off the Mountain Pacific Invitational on Friday at 1. The torch has been lit. Back to you. A longtime USC coach reached a very impressive, impressive milestone this past week. Jovan Vavic, coach of both the men's and women's USC water polo teams, got his 500th career win by doing something the football team could not, beat Stanford this past weekend. Vavik has been coaching at USC since 1995 when he began as the women's water polo coach. In his 21-year career, Vavik's overall record is 582. With 14 team titles this year, under Vavik, the men's team is off to an undefeated start. So Alexa, have you ever had 500 of anything? I've definitely had 500 Skittles. At once? No, actually not at once. That would be quite unhealthy. You're very right. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. We'll see you next week.